Colonel Dr. Anthony Crespi was part of a USCM combat mission that came to grief. With the Xenomorph Hive located on Solano's moon, Crespi was among several other Marines present for the core purpose, as regulations dictated, to serve as backup for the lead team and provide retreat escort if necessary. The lead team consisted of Marines brandishing the latest in USCM weapons technology, particle plasma projectors, which the team expected to liquefy every last alien in the cavern. A sort of test run on the technology, believing this to be the first step in finally bringing an end to the Xenomorph species for good. The mission went awry very quickly, with the superior firepower proving to be no match against the seemingly endless hordes of Xenomorphs that would come to defend their hive and their queen against the human threat. The USCM's confidence in their newly developed technology had been gravely misplaced, and the event, in short, was a complete massacre. With Marines being slaughtered left and right, Crespi was able to hold his own and find a way for the remaining team to escape, though not before coming face to face with the alien queen, who in her fury severely wounded Crespi with a strike of her piercing claws. Narrowly escaping her grasp, thanks to backup provided by Captain Gibbs, he was able to make his way to the dropship Evac, though the unrelenting Xenomorphs would follow, and continue their attacks to eliminate the threat to the Hive. Crespi would be the only survivor of this incident. Nine years later, Crespi was assigned for duty aboard the Anominata, with his past experiences making him a prime candidate to succeed David Lennox, Dr. Church's research assistant who had died recently of a heart attack. Officially, Crespi's duty was to replace Lennox, though unofficially he was tasked to investigate Church and his methods. His classified orders permitted him to take emergency command of the ship, should his discretion deem it necessary. The Anominata and the experiments taking place aboard had a reputation that preceded itself, with many whispers and worries about what exactly may be taking place there, and ugly rumors that the crew was considered expendable and used in clandestine experiments. The ship had come to be called She Who Cannot Be Named. Upon arrival, Crespi was quick to pass harsh judgment on Church's operations, but he slowly started to come around and align himself with Church's way of thinking when he saw the results of the experiments on the captive Xenomorph specimens. Upon witnessing Church administer electroshocks to the specimen, Crespi even admits, To tell you the truth, I wouldn't mind giving that thing a shock or two for old Langson myself. I had a run-in with a flock of those monsters once. We knew they were dangerous, of course, but I didn't know how they... how they were. All I remember is that skin, that stink, flashes of tubes and drool, and those teeth, and blood. Impressed with his findings, which Crespi himself described as mind-numbingly important, as well as hearing about, though not in explicit detail, that Church also survived an encounter with the Xenomorphs, Crespi and Church formed an uneasy rapport, though it would soon be challenged after a briefing with a USCM colleague, Lieutenant Sharon McGinnis, who had been investigating Church herself. The man you were sent here to replace, David Lennox, was my fiancé, McGinnis explains. He had been Church's research partner for six years when we met. David tried repeatedly to have himself transferred, but could never get the orders. Something was happening here. He tried to send me a coded message, but it arrived scrambled. Then I was told he died of a heart attack, on board the Anominata. Shortly afterwards, my apartment was burglarized. Everything he'd ever sent me was taken. Everything, even love letters. I need to know what happened here. I'm certain David didn't die of a heart attack. All the crew medical records have been altered. 34 deaths occurred in the last three years. With only one shuttle arriving to and from the Anominata per year, the numbers certainly weren't adding up, though McGinnis' investigation of the station mainline showed three additional shuttles arriving per year for the past five years. She voiced her suspicions clearly. Whatever's going on here has support from higher up. Crespi, however, wouldn't remain entirely trusting of McGinnis either, believing her to be motivated by her own paranoia regarding Church and Lennox, and later suspecting her of corporate espionage and spying for a rival company. The implications and possibilities of Dr. Church's research had seduced Crespi to the point of blindness over the careful manipulation taking place. He has opened the doors to technological innovation that borders on the mystical. The work he is doing here will change the face of science forever. McGinnis, reaching the point of desperation to find the truth regarding the secrets of Dr. Church, would repeatedly plea to Crespi's reason. The alien research is only a small part of what he's doing here. The station resource requirements don't jibe with the consumption records. Something on board the Anominata is using almost a third again as much power as all known systems, including the alien lab, combined. Church has a hidden operation on board, sir, something big, something he doesn't want you to find. He's engaged your interest in the alien research to throw you off the track. 
The source of the power consumption would be confirmed once Crespi and McGinnis were able to locate Church's secret lab, containing all the deceased crew members that were supposedly jettisoned. The lab was filled with mutated, mutilated monsters of former human beings, all due to Church's radical experimentation, including David Lennox, who, as McGinnis observes, is actually still alive. Not unlike David Eight, as seen in Alien Covenant, Dr. Church would find it necessary to use human subjects to unlock the potential of the Xenomorph. When confronted, Church explains the method behind his madness. Originally I tried to develop a viral bomb to eliminate aliens forever, but my experiments yielded unexpected, miraculous results. You've heard rumors, no doubt. Nervous metabiotics, self-replicating brain tissue, acquired infrasensory abilities, the so-called time serum. Though I killed no one. I appropriated the bodies of soldiers who died in the line of duty. You are the slave to sweetness and light, and what are they? Prosthetic abstractions conceived by embryonic minds, unable to cope with the truth. Where does good exist? In your empty skull. You can be bought with a cookie, fooled with three words. God, if you only knew how I see you, humans. Must you always believe in appearances? I didn't survive the hive. I am the hive. When I look the cosmos in the eye, it blinks. You have the honor of contributing to my research, although you won't be in any condition to appreciate it. You will have assisted in the creation of an evolutionary bridge to the true crown of creation. The pink poetry of man will be subsumed by the black blank genius of the alien, and the result will be the original and final creature. It will feed and live off itself, and I will join it. It would seem the dying hive that was home to the good doctor all those years ago imparted the desperate need for the xenomorph survival onto him, leading to the rest of his life being devoted to the xenomorph. Not to fighting it, not to stopping it, but to perfect it beyond anyone's wildest dreams or nightmares. Church lured the duo into his maze, forcing them to fight for their survival as the xenomorph specimen stalked them, knowing full well they wouldn't survive and he would soon have further bodies to appropriate. But something unexpected happened. McGinnis was able to escape the deadly maze and fueled by a rage towards Church, was able to stand off against her alien pursuer and will it into submission, bending at her telepathic request to hoist her out of the pit, all without the aid of any FITR telepathine as used in previous experiments. Despite this remarkable display, Dr. Church would not end up being held accountable for his crimes. McGinnis would survive the ordeal, Crespi, however, would not, succumbing to the wounds given to him by Xenomorphs within the maze and finally being mercy killed by McGinnis. While McGinnis would be apprehended by the USCM facing a tribunal for sabotage and for murder, Crespi in death would find himself an integral part of Church's twisted experiments, bringing them both one step closer to creating Church's original and final creature. Depending on how far Church's influence reached, do you think it's possible that his figurative labyrinth goes so deep as to have requested the higher-ups at Weyland yutani to provide Crespi's services, possibly because of his past experiences? Specifically, do you think his wounds at the hands of the Xenomorph Queen may have left some kind of unseen infection and DNA alteration that unlocked the key to exactly what Church needed to complete his masterpiece? Opposite to that, with humans holding biological keys to creating and or perfecting the xenomorph species, do you think considering McGinnis' displays with no artificial intervention of drugs, could humans also hold the key to unlocking the ability to control and or destroy the xenomorph? Comment below and share your thoughts. And as always, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a like and subscribe for all the latest theories and explanations of the alien universe. If you'd like to see a topic covered, please comment below with your suggestion. And in the meantime, you can follow Alien underscore Theory on Twitter and Alien Theory YT on Facebook for more. And until next time, this is Alien Theory, signing off.